Never know why the Lord put us where he put us. I've complained about my place sometimes as well. And asked, why am I found in places that I am found when I'm not even good at it? And uh, it's like the Lord saying, that's because it's not about you. And it's not anything that you have done. But it's me in you. Remember um, Gideon? He said, God, you me, I'm the least in my father's house. And you're calling me? And God said, go in the strength that I have given you. We prepare ourselves and we do what we can. But God is still in, in charge. Praise the Lord. Don't run from what God gave you. And there are a lot of people who have been running. But he's already where you're running, waiting. A thought came into my heart some time ago and said, be careful what you chase. You might catch up to it. <laughs> and it may be like asking for bread <clears throat> and you get a stone. Because you chased it. He won't give you stone if you ask for bread. Jesus said that. But sometimes he gives us bread and we chase the stone. But he's still a wonderful God. Thank you, Father. This morning I want to share from James. I want to continue what I started in April. I spoke on James 1. So I'm going to call it part 2. Look, listen, then do. Look, listen, and do. Part two. And I'm going to read from James 1, 22 to 27. And I won't even be able to go through all the verses, but there's certain points I'd like to make. So let's read. Um, it's from the NIV. Do not merely listen to the word. And so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in the mirror and, after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom, one version say the perfect law of liberty, and continuing it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. You notice where the blessing is attached? It's attached in obeying. Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongue deceive themselves, and their religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Amen. Father, we thank you that you have brought us together again. You are such a good God, a faithful, a merciful, and a patient God. Thank you, Lord, for being so patient with all of us, Lord. Thank you for whatever you have allowed us to do, you have enabled us to do. Jesus, we do it all to your glory. And Lord, we commit this morning, the rest of it, into your hand, as Lord, and ask you that you will guide the few words that I'll share this morning that it may be edifying to your people. Lord, it is your spirit that gives the inspiration. It is he who brings everything back to remembrance. It is the same spirit that you said, he shall lead you into all things. And so we pray to lead us this morning, Lord. We believe in your word, and Lord, we have nothing else to say but your word. So guide us in that, Lord, that we may be faithful to it, for therein is the blessing. Thank you, Father. We honor you. Thank you for everyone that is here. May you open hearts and lives to receive you, to see you, Lord. May your will be done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. Okay, I'll show a few points that I, I got from, from the Life Application Bible. We need to know what the Word of God says. 
and we are not to replace it or equate it with human opinions. Everyone has an opinion, but only God's word is the truth. Jesus said, thy word is truth. I remember in our men's breakfast, there were a few of us here yes, um, yesterday, and we were talking and said, you know, you know, when we meet together, we, we do a lot of talking. We talk about every issue and we fix them all. <laughs> you know, <laughs> as we usually do. <laughs> but I, I was reminded, the, the man yesterday said, you know, we talk a lot of things and the, the politics and all the religion and all that's happening around us. But I want us to remember all this. We need to make sure we are grounded in the word of God. For everybody has an opinion. No, and everybody's opinion is right. And yet they are in conflict with each other. So therefore, we need a source that does not change. And we find that in God. We just mentioned, I just read as Sister Sophie was uh, giving her um, testimony, that even though she wanted to give up that gift, and then went to the scripture that says the gift and calling of the Lord is without repentance. And in that verse of scripture, just where it says, for he does not change. God doesn't change. It is equally or even more important to do what the word of God says. See, it, it, it's one thing to read it. But the better thing even after reading it is to do what it says. The evidence of the work or the effectiveness of the word in our lives is reflected in our behavior. And the best evidence of learning is a change in our behavior. I, so often growing up as children with your parents said, you haven't heard a word I said, did you? You know, that's because we went and did the same thing. No change has taken place. We have not learned. To hear the word of God, but not to obey it, is to deceive ourselves. Because we can go away feeling good that I know the word of God, I can quote the scriptures. There are people who can say the 23rd Psalm on the Lord's Prayer. Another passage of scripture, when we went to school back in Jamaica, you know, that was a big part of our, our curriculum, Bible knowledge. And there were so, certain scripture. We could recite Exodus 20, the Ten Commandments. We could recite Psalm 27. We could recite um, Psalm 23. We could recite the Lord's Prayer and various other scriptures. We could recite the Beatitudes. We know them all, <laughs> but we didn't live them. So we're just deceiving ourselves when we read it or learn it, but don't obey it. As I said, I repeat again, the blessing is in the obeying of the word of God. A mirror reflects the image in front of it. The word of God as a mirror shows us our faults and our shortcomings and the remedy to make corrections. But if we don't apply it to our lives, it is like standing in front of the natural mirror, seeing the flaws, but walk away and do nothing about it. That's why the scripture says, if we look in the word of God and walked away, it's like looking in the mirror. We see our faults, and I can show you that most of us here, when we stand in front of the mirror, for those who have hair, if one is out of place, <laughs> you're going to fix it before you leave. Because you don't, you don't want to out, go outside and somebody told you about it. You know, you're going to figure, I'm not taking care of myself. Uh, what else is out of place? Remember that James is writing to the believers who were scattered abroad because of the severe persecution against the early church. As I said in the first part um, some time ago, James was like a pastor. He was a brother, a half-brother of Jesus, who did not believe in Jesus as the Messiah at first, but after the resurrection, he did. 
and he actually became the first overseer of the early church. What a change. And he was writing to the Christians who were scattered. Because after the early church started, we know about the stoning of Stephen, but there was widespread persecution against the Christians. And so many of them left Jerusalem and they were scattered all over. And James was writing to encourage them because they were facing hardships. And so that's why he was saying, this is the way that you need to live and conduct yourself even when you are facing hardships. And I find it so interesting that in the day that we live in today, there are those who want to tell you that if you come to Christ, your troubles are over. That you will not face any hardship. Some even make it feel that if you're facing hardship, something must be wrong with your faith. So James wasn't telling people here that something was wrong with their faith. He's telling them that this is what you are going to face. It was encouraging, and he was encouraging and instructing them on proper Christian living, even under severe persecution. He actually said, count it pure joy in the face of trials or persecution. In other words, instead of complaining, count it all joy. These are people that were there in the beginning who face actual persecution. In fact, he was martyred. But he's encouraging people that they are to count it pure joy in the face of trials and persecution. You've got to ask yourself when you listen today to what's happening. Every time we face something in today's Christianity, we are complaining. We want to protest. We want this one to change. And we fight against this and we fight against that. And James said, count it pure joy. Are we saying, I don't want the joy? Sometimes, uh, you know, I think to myself, the people that complain the most are the people who have had it the best all their lives. And any time anything ever attempt to disrupt it, I've got my rights. You can't take that from me. You can't stop me from doing that because I've got my constitutional right. Actually, our constitution is the word of God. Why would you say that? Am I saying that we don't obey the government? Yes, we do. The Bible said that. Until they tell us that we can't worship God. There's a difference. But if the scripture said, this world is not my home, I am a citizen of another world. That means there are rules that I need to live by in, in getting ready for that world. So in this world, we are going to face persecution because the scripture says we are strangers and sojourners. We actually use the word foreigners. And because of that, the lifestyle that we live for Christ is not going to be compatible with the world. And I want to put us on warning that if we think things are hard now, just wait. We often talk about the change in lifestyle in this world, in this city. And some things that if I said it the way I feel it, <laughs> I'd get into a lot of trouble. <laughs> My. But the, 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 the pressure to conform to the world is right in your face. There was a time when sin used to hide in the dark. But it doesn't hide anymore. It takes its place in the marketplace, in the halls of government, and it makes its voice heard loud and clear. 
And if you dare to raise a correction or an objection, you are out of place. You are intolerant. Can't have that. That's the way the world is. So to live for Christ is to live in contradiction to the world. But that's what Paul said in Romans 12. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. James was already talking to them and said, you are going to face hardship. Jesus says, in this world, you will face persecution, but be of good courage. I have overcome the world. And now the scripture says, it is enough for the servant to be like his master. If they persecute me, they will persecute you. If they loved me, they will love you. If they love my father, they would have loved me, he said. So therefore, if we are going to be like Christ, which the Bible said we are to be, and we are moving to immaturity, then we are going to face these things. Therefore, we may be prepared for it, and we must be prepared for it. Scripture says evil men will wax worse and worse as we see the day of the Lord appearing. In verse 21, James exhorts his hearers, get rid of all the filth and evil in your lives and humbly accept the word God has planted in your hearts for it has the power to save your souls. So here is a call for us that when we don't conform to the world, it means we are not going to participate with everything that the world does. We know we live in what they call a value-free society where there's no morals anymore. Oh, Lord help us. It's getting harder to be a Christian in this world. It's getting harder for Christian people to send their kids to public school. There are many now that are in a quandary not sure what they should do with their children. Because their children are going to be told stuff and encourage stuff that you know are completely contradictory to scripture. And that's what we are going to be facing. I often said, I know we have, we have a, a three-year-old grandson, and the Lord has blessed us with another one on the way, a little, a little girl, as Chris and, uh, and Shanice are going to have their, their second child. And they are wondering what to do about schooling already because they want to raise their children godly. It's not in the school. Everything can be mentioned, but the name of God can't be. Everything is right, but the name of God is out of place. Those are the things that we are facing. And it's getting, going to get worse. I often said, I'm glad I'm not raising children. But then I remember their grandchildren. <laughs> That's right. Lord, help us. Scripture said, gird up the lines of your minds with the truth. There may be times when the privileges that we have as Christians, we may not have it anymore. Because they'll be taken away. Because if you can't conform, it's already happening. A few years ago, there is a, I won't mention the name, a well-known Christian organization group in this province. They, they have done a whole lot of stuff, good stuff over the years. And they used to get some support from the government for their summer program to hire students. But because they would not change their belief, the government stopped supporting them. So we've got to be prepared. There's going to come a time when we're going to say, Lord, now I'm going to go out. And I don't know what I'm going to face but I'm going to go out in your name. I'm going to walk in your name. I'm going to speak in, in your name because it will get that close. And some people may say, well, if that's the way it's going to be, then I don't want to be a, a believer. 
My question is, what's your choice? What's the alternative? What is the alternative? Because I can tell you this, the only way we can get out of this world is to get in contact with Jesus. That's the only way of escape for what is coming upon the world. That sounds very ominous, but it's the truth, which sometimes you don't hear today. We tend to forget that this world has a timeline on it. Life in this world has a timeline attached to it. There is an expiry date of the type of life that's been lived in the world today. It has an expiry date. When we talk about the end times, it means the end times. It means the end. Something is going to come to an end. It's going to stop. And the question is, when it stops, what happens next? That's what we need to be prepared for. I remember a story where um, somebody was trying to talk to a young, a young man about his life and the future. And he said, what, what are your plans? He said, well, my plan, I'm going to school. And then he said, what next? He said, well, I guess uh, I'll graduate and get a job. He said, and then what next? He said, well, I'll probably marry, uh, uh, have a family. And then he said, what next? Uh, well, probably buy a house. What next? I'll probably grow up or get old. Then what next? He's beginning to get annoyed at this point. I guess I'll die like everybody else. What next? What do you mean, what next? Life on this earth, when it comes to an end, is not the end. Death is like a door. You just leave here and you go over there. For you see, folks, we are not just physical. We are also spiritual. This physical man will perish. But there's a life in us which comes from God. It's eternal. We, we have often heard that uh, the scripture says that when someone dies, we always hear the, the phrase, ash to ash, dust to dust. That's because we came from the earth. And God said to Adam, you were taken from the earth and you will return to the earth. But the scripture also says when we die, the spirit, the spirit goes to God while the body goes to the earth from where, where it was taken. So that part of us is eternal. We live on. And by God's promise, for those who know him will be given a new body. So death is not the end. But the only time you can make preparation is on this side of death. We can't wait until the other side. And there are many people who are saying, I'll just take my chances. I, I spoke to a man one day and I said, you know, you got to be saved or something. Upon. He said, I'll just take my chances. I said, you're going to take your chances at the judgment, right? He said, yeah, I'll just take my chances. And I hope my good deeds will outweigh my bad deeds. Why would you, why would you do that? A person will only do and say that because they don't understand. They're ignorant of what this is all about. God didn't send his son to this world to suffer a cruel death that ends up meaning nothing. It's like the people believe in, in evolution. And I often ask, I say, look, take a look around you. Look at life in nature. Look at your life. Look at the wonders. Are you telling me this is just here for nothing? For no reason? There are people who believe that, you know. In fact, there are people who believe that, well, how can you even tell that I am real? Really? Yes. And I'm not talking about people we consider foolish. 
I'm talking about in the halls of universities where people are wondering if we are actually here. In a, there was a debate and there was a man who was giving an example and he, he said in a university one student stood up and said, well, professor, professor, how do you know that I'm even here, that I'm real? To which a professor responds, on whom shall I say is asking? <laughs> now, <laughs> that's high intellectual answer. I have an answer which is not as high. But I would say, if you want to know you're here, here's what you do. You take a hammer, put your finger on a rock, and hit it as hard as you can. If you scream, you're here. <laughs> if you don't scream, you're already dead. <laughs> it's amazing what man has done with what God has given to him. When God is not in the picture, it's like in Jamaica, they would say, boy, you turn fool, fool. When God is not in the picture, it's like people lose all sense of connection and reality. Things that are clear before you. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. And people are saying there is no God. It all happened like that. Lord help us. In verse 25, James says, The law of liberty which makes us free means God's law for free men and women, true believers, or those who have accepted him. And I'll just read the 25th verse again. It says, but whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. So what James is saying again, just to read the word of God is not enough. But we have to look at it intently, actually, more than just a passing glance. It's what is expressed in the gospel. The, the, the law of liberty is what is expressed in the, in, in the gospel. I know that um, when we talk about law, we are talking about the Mosaic law. All right? And that we are not saved by keeping the law. And the reason for that is because Jesus came and fulfilled the righteousness of the law, and by us believing in him, then he imputed that righteousness on us. So the perfect law of liberty is what Jesus came to do and fulfill. All right, and our, our job is to respond to that and believe in Jesus. God's law, or his words, points out sin in our lives, and by the conviction of the Holy Spirit, leads us to repentance and to ask for forgiveness of our sins. That's what the word of God does. That's what the law did. It points out how wrong we are, but God didn't leave us there. Having shown us where we are, he didn't leave us there. That's why he sent his son, Jesus Christ. We need more than just a casual look at the word of God. To look intently is to look earnestly and carefully and studiously, which means you need to study it. Scripture says, study to show yourself approved. A workman that does not need to be ashamed. The point is that when you are asked, why do you believe what you believe? We should be able to give an answer. But if we don't pay any attention to it, then we can't give an answer. We need to know what the word of God, it's amazing to see that some of the people that are involved in cults are more adept in what they're doing than Christians who are saved. Because we, we, we get to talk to one of these cults and people, in fact, some Christians don't even want to talk to them. Because I don't, I don't want you to confuse me. I don't want you to change me. I used to have some good time talking to these people that come to the doors. Because I never turned them away. They left. <laughs> because I'm 
I'm talking to them. I listen to what they say. And then I begin to tell them what the word. I've met with them. I've met with some one time and I said, well, maybe we should have you talk to our elders. So we arranged a meeting and we, we, we met. We was over here sometime in, a, in the house of a brother that used to live in this area. I met with them. Yeah, and they left. You know what they usually say? We have to agree to disagree. And they're gone. But we need to know what the word of God says. We don't all have to be scholars, but we should be able to give a reason of the hope that we have. And then we must abide in it or practice what it says or, as James puts, puts it, a door of the work. That's what brings the blessing of God. Just like Abraham who proved that he believed what God told him by his obedience and was declared righteous because of his faith. We talk about uh, being Abraham, the father of the faithful, and that we are, by faith, children of God, but Abraham believed God. That's why James said, Was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous? For what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar, you see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. Now, and sometimes there is some confusion in some people's mind about work and faith, because you see, James says, if you have faith, but you don't do anything about it, can faith save you? And Paul says, we are saved by faith through grace, not of works. And people don't understand what these two men are saying. Paul says, you can't work to save yourself. It's through faith. James says, you've got faith, don't you? Prove it. That's, that's all there is. If you really have faith, then leave it out. Because faith has feet. And faith have hands. So actions are attached to faith. We are not doing good works so that we can be saved. We do good works because we are saved. And that's clearly what the scripture says. And here Paul is saying, in Ephesians 2, 8 to 10, God saved you by his grace when you believed and you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. There are many people who are convinced that their good deeds will get them into heaven. Some say, as long as my good deeds outweigh the bad deeds, then I'll be fine. I remember talking to a man where I used to work years ago, and he said, um, I'm just as good as my neighbor. So uh, my, my neighbor is a, is a minister, and I'm just as good as he. If he, if he goes, I'm going too. <laughs> That's not a good testimony <laughs> for that person who he's referring to. Considering, you know, you're not, you're not sure what he, what he meant, means by that. But people have to compare themselves. I've heard people said, maybe a relative, maybe a father, maybe a brother. He's such a good person. Certainly God will take him in. It's good to do good works. And everybody should do good works. But all the work that we do, unless... Unless we put our faith and our trust in Jesus Christ, there is no salvation in our works. But that's not what the scripture says in terms of doing good in order to be saved. It's by faith in the finished works. Did you see where the work, word works come? It's by faith in the finished works of Christ. And by nothing else can anyone be saved 
are made righteous. That means the work for salvation was done by Christ. That's why we believe him. We put faith in him for what he has done. We can't do anything to make ourselves righteous. Isaiah said, for there is none righteous, no, not one. And Paul said, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And in another verse of scripture, just to show you the completeness of that, he said, the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. You see, we all get to pay for what we do. Isn't it? And since we were all sinners, because the scripture says we were born in sin and shaped in iniquity, that means we all have a payment, and it's called death. How then can we escape that? Jesus paid the price. He did the work. And all we need to do is to put our faith in him because we cannot, could not do the work. It's not a matter of saying that, um, you know, God said your work is good enough. It's just that we just can't. We just can't. After all, the, 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 the Jews, the Israelites, got the Ten Commandments. But what happened to them? The scripture said God overthrew them in the wilderness because the word was not mixed with faith. That's why they lost out. Imagine this. They actually heard the voice of God thundering from Mount Sinai. It was so uh, awesome, so terrible. When I say terrible, I mean beyond what they could stand. They said to Moses, you talk to him. We don't want to talk to him. Moses himself said, I exceedingly fear. That's just, do you know that's the same God we are talking about today? But he has given us his son, Jesus Christ. That's the God we would face. When they approached the mountain, God said to them, Tell the people, don't even touch the mountain. Because his presence came down on the mountain. And he said to the people, to Moses, tell them not, in fr first of all, he said, tomorrow you will bring them in front of the mountain, not to touch it. Tell them to wash their clothes. Clean themselves. It was a form of physical sanctification. But he said, when they come to the mountain, tell them not to even touch it. For if as much as an animal touched the mountain, it would die. That's why we, we have the scripture that says, No man has seen God and live face to face, but only hidden in Christ. He is the mediator. He is the one who goes between us and the Father. God is not someone to play around with. The way people talk about God today, you would think he's just my body. He is the man upstairs. He's still an awesome God. He's still a consuming fire. That's why we need to hide in Jesus. When Moses asked God one time, Lord, you haven't shown yourself to me. God took him and put him in the cleft of a rock. And cover his hand so that he wouldn't see the face of God. Because if he did, he would die. That's the same God we are serving today. We tend to believe that because he's not shaking the earth and burning up people when they curse his name. Certainly he's lost his, his mojo, I guess. <laughs> but he's still the same God. Is still a consuming fire. But we're hiding in Jesus. That's why you, we can't approach the Father without the Son. He's the mediator. He's the go-between. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. 
so none of us can boast. For we are God's masterpiece. That's verse 10 of Ephesians 2. He has created us anew in Christ so we can do the good things he planted for us long ago. What that means, that God already had in mind what those who serve him would look like, what they would behave like. But because of sin, we could not. But Jesus came and, and believing in him, he's got all these good works. that said, now my children who obey me, this is how they will live. So he's got it prepared, but we got to be saved before we can live that. Not live it so we can be saved. We can give all the money we want. You can't buy salvation. We, in fact, the body said, the scripture said, even if I give my body to be burned, if we do not have Jesus in our lives, it's not going to save us. That reference was to, was to love, that if I sing like angel and do whatever, and give my body to burn and do not have love, I am just like a gong. Noisemaker. There are many people are convinced that their good deeds is good enough. But it's not what the scripture says. The Ten Commandments given to Moses and Sinai to Israel are an expression of God's holiness or his righteous standard. His chosen people, Israel, failed to live up to them. They couldn't. But God has not changed his standard. He said, I am the Lord. I change not. You see, when you see the Ten Commandments, you shall have no other gods before me. You know how many times people put other things between them and God? Even as Christians. When he says, you shouldn't do that, I shouldn't do that because I'm a jealous God. Actually, Paul said, I was okay until the law came and sin revived and I died. In other words, without the law, we wouldn't know what God's requirements are. But when the law came, it, it, it's just so amazing. It's, it's like you're going on fine. You say, you know, everything is good. And then the law came. And said, no, you're not. And it exposed us. And then we said, what do I do? That's what Paul said. Woe is me. Who will deliver me from the body of this death? I found out that I, am, I thought I was doing well. And now the law came and showed me God's standard. And I can't live up to God's standard. But when he said, who will deliver me? He said, but I thank my Lord Jesus Christ. To show you, God shows us a standard and said, no, you can't reach it. I'm going to have to do something for you. And he did it. Which is why people should realize this. When you talk about judgment, when you talk about judgment, people will often say, well, how could a loving God send people to hell? And all kind of, you hear this argument all the time. But I, I, I like to say to people, if you think about awfulness, and you want to know the awfulness of sin, just look at the cross. God did that to his son so that you would not have to go there. It's not because God is sending people to hell. Jesus himself said, hell was made for the devil and his angels. That's why he came to intercept our journey. Because from the time Adam fell, that's where it all began, we were headed to that place. And God, seeing that, sent his son Jesus Christ. <clears throat> so it's not God sending people to hell. It's people rejecting heaven. Because he's provided he said, he said to, to actually Israel in the wilderness, he said, Behold, I set before you life and death. And then he said, choose life. In case you're, you're having a hard time making the decision, choose life. It's like somebody come up to you and say, there's a million dollars in this hand. And here's 
a million dollar death in this hand and money that you owe. I said, give you a choice. Choose that one. And they still choose the death. That's what people are doing. So Jesus came not to destroy, but to fulfill the laws and the prophets. The righteous requirements of the law was met by Jesus. Lord, you see that if we can't fulfill it, Israel failed because Israel is human like us. They couldn't. We can look at them and criticize them for how rebellious they are, but all they are doing is shows who we are, all of us. So they couldn't because we couldn't either. In fact, Peter said, why are we laying all these things on people that even our forefathers couldn't do? But God, seeing that we couldn't, Jesus came and said, now, here's how it should be done. All you have to do is believe in me. It's as simple as that. By, the, by his death, he paid the full demands of the righteous law of God for the sins of the whole world. And because the father is pleased with the sacrifice of his beloved son, all who put their faith in him have their sins forgiven and are declared righteous before God. You ever heard, notice the word? People trust in God don't earn righteousness. They are declared righteous. Because you can't earn it. Even if they obeyed the law, and scripture said, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified. Justified here means set free. But we are declared righteousness. Abraham believed God and God said, you're righteous. That's the same thing with us. We believe in Jesus Christ and he said, you're righteous. This perfect law of liberty, I'm closing that James spoke about in 25 is not a freedom to live or do as we please. As Peter wrote in 1 Peter 2, 14 to 16, he says, for the Lord's sake, submit to all human authority, whether the king as head of state or the officials he has appointed, for the king has sent him to punish those who do wrong, and, and, uh, sorry, and to honor those who do right. It is God's will that your honorable lives should silence those ignorant people who make foolish accusations against you. For you are free, yet you are God's slave. So don't use your freedom as an excuse to do evil. Respect everyone and love the family of believers. Fear God and respect the king. See that scripture I just read there? That flies in the face of a lot of believers today. Because he said, fear God and respect the king. That's representing government. There are many people believe that, oh, I can't listen to government. I only listen to God. Well, I guess God didn't know that. Because he gave his word. And tell us what to do, how to live in this world. Why? so that your life can be a testimony. Don't use your liberty. Now, you see, we are free. But don't use your liberty as a cloak for unrighteousness. We don't realize that when Peter was writing this, they were living in a day when people were saying, because the flesh is evil, you can't help it. So even though you're a Christian, your spirit doesn't sin, but your flesh can sin and it won't matter because the flesh is going to be destroyed. You heard about the Gnostic Gospels? That's what was happening in those days where people were separating the flesh from the spirit and said, you're saved, but you can still carry on and do as you always do. And Paul is, Peter is saying, do not use your liberty as a cloak or as an excuse. Your liberty is in Christ. It's not an excuse to go and break the law and live immorally and do whatever you want. Oh, I know that governments don't do the will of God. Oh, I know that. But the Lord said, 
he does not carry, speaking of government, he does not carry the sword in vain. And it's God who sets up government. Scripture said that. And it's God who takes down government. So when government is doing wrong, just get on our knees and pray to God and live for the Lord. For the same government who give you some rights can take it back. Our liberty is in Christ. Why does James talk about all this persecution? I mean, why didn't, why didn't they go up to Rome and ask Nero? I said, what are you doing, Nero? Don't you know that we are free? And they were living in the time of emperor worship. When they were forced to worship emperor, and a Christian wouldn't. That's where the difference comes in, folks. When we are asked to turn from God and turn to those things, we say, no, we can't do that. We will worship God. We have been freed from the bondage of sin that we may become the bond servant of Christ Jesus. We are freed from sin so we can live for Christ freely because we were in bondage to sin. No, we are not in bondage to sin because Christ's life is in us. And if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. All things are past and all things are become new. I repeat the opening statement to close. We need to know what the word of God says. And we are not to replace it or equate it with human opinions. Everyone has an opinion. But only God's word is true. Jesus said, John 17, 17. Sanctify them by thy truth. Your word is truth. What do we have to live by? And I encourage you this morning, folks. Let's stay with the word Everything will perish, but my word shall not perish. God bless you.